Hey, Google. Thanks for joining. And we're doing chapter 10 of The Intelligent Investor. So, uh, if you don't know my name, my name is Nate Ozla. Good morning, good morning. It is a beautiful Friday morning. Hi, Michael. No? Oh, welcome. <laughs> Where are you from? So, uh, today I'm going to do chapter 10 of The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. And it's The Investor and His Advisors. And my name is May Zoglau. My blog is yesfinanciallyfree.com. So if you haven't gone there already, put your first name and email address on the right side, get on my email list, because I email my email list every time I go live and tell them what I'll be talking about, in addition to giving them lots of great information on financial freedom. So go there and do that first, so that you know exactly what I'll be live about, and then you can decide if you want to see it or not. All of my lives are really informative and useful, and will help you become financially free. I do them because they help me become financially free. Time. So, why am I reading this book? Because the markets are down, right? The markets are down. And this is a book, this is the person who trained Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett says he's the greatest teacher on security investing. So, if Warren Buffett says he's awesome, I'm going to read his book. Okay? And every serious investor reads this book. So, um, you can read it with me. All right? I've never read it before. I'm reading it live this month okay so we're going to get this book done and you can come along for the ride why is this now well everyone says that well summer has gone up but they said that it came to a big decline and it's a good time to invest in the market there might be another housing crisis um all kinds of things might happen it take two to three years to recover from everything that's going on right now so it's a good time to learn how to invest in the stock market, and the best person that knows how to do that is this guy. Now, if you think you can do it all on your own, go for it. But you just just warning you, unless you're just doing you know index fund, dollar cost averaging, you might get screwed over because most people who just go invest without thinking lose money. I'm one of them. <laughs> so he he could teach us how to be intelligent. Right? An intelligent investor. So that's why I'm reading it now. Um, if you've already read it and you're already into all this, you're already a great investor, fine. But if you haven't read this book then, and you want to invest intelligently, then listen along, read it with me, or just read it yourself. But that's why I'm reading this book. Quickly, um, my name, like I said, is Nathan Blau, and I've been reading it almost every weekday morning. I've been um, sleeping in a couple mornings and not eating, <laughs> been getting tired. Um, I've been exercising a lot since this whole COVID lockdown. I've been exercising, going to the beach, going to the beach yesterday, before yesterday, went running the day before yesterday, went on long walks. You know, we've been exercising and totally getting in shape. Um, so a lot of stuff's changing. Um, my body is changing into a more healthy form of itself and all kinds of things. So it's really great, actually, um, in that sense. So let's talk about why I do this. So in 2011, I had a lot of debt, over $40,000 of debt. I only had, I worked at a bank, private banking assistant, so it wasn't a very fancy job. And uh, I had more debt than the salary. The salary was like thirty four, thirty five thousand 35000 a year. My debt was um, forty one, right? And that's before taxes my salary. So I didn't get that much money. <laughs> uh, and I used to be horrible with money. I spent more than I had. I didn't save. I didn't invest. It, you know, and I finally realized I didn't like being in debt. I didn't like having so many money problems, you know. So I, I changed. I did some basic things. I, I studied a lot of financial freedom um, sages, wise people like T. Har Becker and Tony Robbins wrote that book, Money. And well, I read that only recently, but T. Har Becker, Secrets of Million in Mind, Richard Man Babylon, um, which did forever, every Kiyosaki, I played cash flow game over and over and over again for weeks. So um started playing cash flow for kids with my son. And it taught me something. It taught me to focus on passive income, focus on being wealthy, focus on my net worth, and not focus on debt, and pay myself first. Always pay myself first. And so I started doing that. And if you want to know more about how to become financially free, just go to my blog, yesfinanciallyfree.com. All the information is there, okay? <laughs> but I started doing it. I started paying myself first, started doing all these things. And lo and behold, 
by 2016 April, all the debt paid off, and um, we were making almost $500 a month of passive income, and I uh, improved our family's net worth by half a million dollars, and quit my job in December of 2016, and started Finance Freedom Mastermind Coaching Online, part-time. So I had one month of vacation with my family in 2017. We went, I wasn't working at a full time job anymore. We went on a cruise to Mexico. That was a seven day cruise. Never went on one. That was a dream of mine to go on a cruise. Uh, we went to Niagara Falls. We went to LA. We went to Toronto. We went to DC. It was great. It was funny. Friends, friends, and family, family. <laughs> and then we went, um, uh, so we bought our first condo, which we moved into in 2017 in Waikiki. And then, uh, second condo in 2018, also Waikiki, that is an Airbnb business. And uh, 2019, we moved out of our first condo and rented, actually. We turned that one into an Airbnb business. We then sold to one of our managers, uh, who is also one of our clients in a finance group mastermind. And then we bought this condo, which we live in, which is bigger, nicer. It's a lot nicer. The other one is half this size. <laughs> so we bought a bigger condo. And we live here now, and it's a great place. It's a couple blocks to the beach. It's so nice. We have, like, a storage locker down there. I feel like we're so pampered. <laughs> Covered parking, which is always nice. Covered secure parking, but we have this nice locker where we can put our surfboards and everything. Very nice place to live. And like I said, it's really close to the beach, really close to everything. Okay, so you got kind of the scoop on who I am, what I do, and my story, all right? I was not in a prestigious job, okay? Um, and I really didn't know anything about money. So I started out from scratch, and I made that much progress. So wherever you are, if you're having a lot of problems, if during this crisis you're panicking about money because you live paycheck to paycheck, right? And now that your job's cut, you have no money, and you're dependent on the government or something, Maybe this is a time to learn how to not be dependent on the government and not live paycheck to paycheck, right? So let's get started, all right? So that's it. The blog, yes, financiallyfree.com. Go there, put in your first name, email address. If you haven't done so, you get the free ebook, Working Parents Guide to Financial Freedom. And you get notifications on when I'm live, also whenever I blog post what it's about, to learn about how to become financially free as quickly as possible, right? All right, thank you for being on. I'm excited. Oh, last thing. There is a products page there. Tons of products. Giving people lots of value. One is the seven day finance freedom challenge. If you don't make any passive income, why not start right now, right? Go to yesfinancialfree.com and go to the products tab. And at the bottom, there's the seven day finance freedom challenge. It's only seven dollars. You get seven emails in seven days. Follow the instructions and you will be making two streams of passive income in seven days. Right? If you don't follow the instructions, you won't, but if you do, and they're not hard instructions, it's just, it just teaches you how to open a high yield savings account to start saving money and how to buy your first dividend of stock of your choice. That's it. Really easy, but you'll start making passive income. And you'll wonder why you didn't do it sooner. Seven dollars. All right. Let's begin. I'm excited. I missed yesterday. I did need to sleep though. Okay. Let's do this. Today we're doing the investor and his advisors. And we shall begin. I'd love to hear what he says. Okay. Here we go. The investor and his advisors, chapter 10. The investment of money and securities is unique among business operations in that it is almost always based to some degree on advice received from others. The great bulk of investors are amateurs. Naturally, they feel that in choosing their securities, they can profit by professional guidance. Yet there are peculiarities inherent in the very concept of investment advice. If the reason people invest is to make money, then in seeking advice they are asking others to tell them how to make money. That idea has some element of naivete. Businessmen seek professional advice on various elements of their business, but they do not expect to be told how to make profit. That is their own ballywack. When they or non-business people rely on others to make investment profits for them, they are expecting a kind of result for which there is no true counterpart in ordinary business affairs. If we assume 
that there are normal or standard income results to be obtained from investing money in securities, then the role of the advisor can be more readily established. He will use his superior training and experience to protect his clients against mistakes and to make sure that they obtain the results to which the money is entitled. It is when the investor demands more than an average return on his money or when his advisor undertakes to do better for him that the question arises whether more is being asked or promised than is likely to be delivered. Advice on investments may be obtained from a variety of sources. These include one, a relative or friend, <laughs> presumably knowledgeable in security. Number two, a local commercial banker. Number three, Financial service or periodical. Uh, sorry, number three, a brokerage firm or investment banking house. Number four is a financial service or periodical. And number five, an investment counselor. The miscellaneous character of this list suggests there is no, that no logical or systematic approach in this matter has been crystallized as yet in the minds of investors. Certain common sense considerations relate to the criterion of normal or standard results mentioned above. Our basic thesis is this. If the investor is to rely cheaply on the advice of others in handling his funds, then either he must limit himself and his advisor strictly to standard, conservative, and even unimaginative forms of investment, or he must have an unusually intimate and favorable knowledge of a person who is going to direct his funds into other channels. But if the ordinary business or professional relationship exists between the investor and the advisor, he that he himself has grown in knowledge and experience and has therefore become confident to pass independent judgment on the recommendation of others. He has then passed from the category of defensive or unenterprising investor into that of aggressive or enterprising investor. Investment counsel and trust services of faith. The truly professional investment advisors, that is, the well-established investment council firms who charge substantial annual fees, are quite modest in their promises and pretensions. For the most part, they place their clients' funds in standard interest and dividend-paying securities, and they rely mainly on normal interest investment experience for their overall results. In the typical case, it is doubtful whether more than 10% of the total fund is ever invested in securities, other than those of leading companies, plus government bonds, including state and municipal issues, nor do they make a serious effort to take advantage of swings in the general market. The leading investment council firms make no claim to being brilliant. They do pride themselves on being careful, conservative, and competent. Their primary aim is to conserve the principal value over the years and produce a conservatively acceptable rate of income. Any accomplishment beyond that, and they do strive to better their goal, they regard in the nature of extra service rendered. Perhaps their chief value to their clients lies in shielding them from costly mistakes. They offer as much as the defensive investor has the right to expect from any counselor serving the general public. What we have said about the well-established investment counsel firms applies generally to the trust and advisory services of the larger bank. Financial services. The so-called financial services are organizations that send out uniform bulletins, sometimes in the form of telegrams, <laughs> telegram is key, to their subscribers. The subjects covered may include the state and prospects of business, the behavior and prospect of the securities market, and information and advice regarding individual issues. They are often an inquiry department, which will answer questions affecting an individual subscriber. The cost of the service average is much less than the fee that investment counselors charge to individual clients. Some organizations, notably Babson, and Standards and Ford, operate on separate levels as a financial service and as an investment counsel. Incidentally, other organizations such as Scudder, Stevens, and Clark operate separately as investment counsels and as one or more investment funds. Uh, finance, the financial services direct themselves on the whole to a whole different segment of the public than do the investment council firms. The, latter, the latter's clients generally wish to be relieved of bother and the need to make decisions. The financial services offer information and guidance to those who are directing their own financial affairs or are themselves advising others. Many of these services combine themselves exclusively, exclusively or nearly so 
to forecasting market movements by various technical methods. We shall dismiss those with the observation that their work does not concern investors, as the term is used in this book. On the other hand, some of the best known, such as Moody's Investment Services Canada Ford, are identified with the technical organizations that compile the voluminous statistical data that form the basis of all serious security analysis. These services have a very kind count, ranging from the most conservative-minded investor to the rankiest speculator. As a result, they must find it difficult to adhere to any clear-cut or fundamental philosophy in arriving at their own their opinions and recommendations. An old established service of the type of Moody's and the others must obviously provide something worthwhile to broad class investors. What is it? Basically, they address themselves to matters in which the average active investor speculator is interested. And their views on these either command some measure of authority or at least appear more loud than those of the unaided kind. For years, the financial services have been making stock market forecasts without anyone taking this activity very seriously. Like everyone else in the field, they are sometimes right and sometimes wrong. Wherever possible, they hedge their opinions so as to avoid the risk of being proved completely wrong. There is a well-developed art of Delphic phrasing that adjusts itself successfully to whatever the future brings. In our view, perhaps a prejudiced one, this segment of their work has no real significance except for the light it throws on human nature in the securities market. Nearly everyone interested in common stocks wants to be told by someone else what he thinks the market is going to do. The demand being there, it must be supplied. Their interpretations and forecasts of business conditions, of course, are much more authoritative and informing. These are an important part of the great body of economic intelligence, which is spread continuously among buyers and sellers of securities and tends to create fairly rational prices for stocks and bonds under most conditions. Unfortunately, undoubtedly, the material published by the financial services adds to the store of information available and fortifies the investment judgment of the client. It is difficult to evaluate the recommendations of individual securities. Each service is entitled to be judged separately. And the verdict can be pro could properly be based only on an elaborate and exclusive study covering many, covering many years. It is our own experience we have noted among them a pervasive attitude which we think tends to impair what could otherwise be useful advisory work. This is their general view that a stock should be bought in the near term prospects of the business are favorable and should be sold in the if these are unfavorable, regardless of the current price. Such a superficial principle often prevents the services from doing the sound analytical job of which their stats are capable. Namely, to ascertain whether stock, the stock appears over or undervalued at the current price in the light of its indicated long term future earning power. The intelligent investor will not do by his buying and selling solely on the basis of recommendations received from the financial service. Once this point is established, the role of financial service then becomes a useful one. Of supplying information and offering suggestions. Advice from brokerage houses. Probably the largest volume of information and advice to the security owning public comes from stock brokers. These are members of the New York Stock Exchange and of other exchanges who execute buying and selling orders for a standard commission. Practically all the houses that deal with the public maintain a statistical or analytical department which answers inquiries and makes recommendations. A great deal of analytical literature, some of it elaborate and expensive, is distributed gratis to the firm's customer, more impressively referred to as clients. A great deal of it, a great deal is at stake in the innocent appearing question whether customers or clients is the more appropriate name. A business has customers, a professional person or organization has clients. The Wall Street brokerage fraternity has probably the highest ethical standard of any business. But it is still feeling its way toward the standards and standing of true perfection. In the past, Wall Street has thrived mainly on speculation, and stock market speculators as a class were almost certain to lose money. Hence, it has been logically impossible for brokerage houses to operate on a thoroughly professional basis. To do that would have required them to direct their efforts toward reducing rather than increasing their business. The farthest that certain brokerage houses have gone in that direction and could have been expected to go is to refrain from inducing or encouraging anyone to speculate. 
such colleges have combined themselves to executing orders, given them to supply financial information and analyses, and to rendering opinions on the investment and security. Thus, in theory at least, they are devoid to, of all responsibility for either the profits or the losses of their respective customers. Most stock exchange houses, however, still adhere to the old time slogan that they are in business to make commissions and that the way to succeed in business is to give the customers what they want. Since the most profitable customers want speculative advice and suggestions, the thinking and activity of the typical firm are pretty closely geared to day to day trading in the market. Thus, it tries hard to help its customers make money in the field where they are condemned almost by mathematical law to lose in the end. By this, we mean that the speculative part of their operations cannot be profitable over the long run for most brokerage house customers. But to the extent that their operations resemble true investing, they may produce investment gains that more than offset the speculative loss. The investor obtains advice and information from stock exchange houses through two types of employees, now known officially as customers, brokers, or account executives, and financial analysts. The customer broker, also called a registered representative, formerly bore the less dignified title of customer's man. Today, he is the one, he is for the most part an individual of good character and considerable knowledge of securities who operates under a rigid code of right conduct. Nevertheless, since his business is to earn commissions, he can hardly avoid being speculation-minded. Thus, the security buyer wants to avoid being influenced by speculative considerations, but ordinarily has to be careful and explicit in his dealing with his customer's broker. He will have to show clearly by word and deed that he's not interested in anything faintly resembling a stock market tip. Once the customer's broker understands clearly that he is a real, has a real investor on his hands, he will expect to play deals with cooperate with it. Financial analysts, normally known chiefly as security analysts, is a person of particular concern to the author, who has been one himself for more than five decades and has helped educate countless others. At this stage, we refer only to the financial analysts employed by Berkeley House. The function of the security analyst is clear enough from his title. It is he who works up the detailed studies of individual securities, develops careful comparisons of various issues in the same field, and forms an expert opinion of the safety or attractiveness or intrinsic value of all the ki different kinds of stocks and bonds. By what must seem a quirk to the outsider, there is no formal requirement for being a security analyst. Contrast with this the fact that a customer's broker must pass an examination, meet the required character test, and be duly accepted and registered by the New York Stock Exchange. As a practical matter, nearly all the younger analysts have had extensive business school training, and the old sirs have acquired at least the equivalent in the school of long experience. In the great majority of cases, the employing worker child can be counted on to assure itself of the qualifications and competence of its analyst. The customer of the brokerage firm may deal with the security analyst directly, or his contact may be an indirect one via the customer's broker. In either case, the analyst is available to the client with a considerable amount of information and advice. Let us make an emphatic statement here. The value of the security analyst to the investor depends largely on the investor's own attitude. If the investor asks the analyst the right questions, he'd like to get the right, or at least valuable answer. The analysts hired by brokerage houses, we are convinced, are greatly handicapped by the general feeling that they are supposed to be market analysts as well. When they are asked whether a given common stock is sound, the question often means is the stock likely to advance during the next few months. As a result, many of them are compelled to analyze with one eye on the stock ticker, a pose not conducive to sound thinking or worthwhile conclusions. In the next section of this book, we shall deal with some of the concepts and possible achievements of security analysis. A great many analysts working for stock exchange firms could be of prime assistance to a bona fide investor who wants to be sure that he gets full value for his money and possibly a little more. As in the case of the customer's brokers, what is needed at the beginning is a clear understanding by the analyst of the investor's attitude and objectives. Once the analyst is convinced that he is dealing with a man who is value-minded rather than quotation-minded, there is an excellent chance that his recommendations will prove a real overall benefit. The CFA Certificate for Financial Analysts. 
The fourth step was taken in 1963 toward giving professional standing and responsibility to financial analysts. The official title of Chartered Financial Analyst, or CFA, is now awarded to those senior practitioners who pass required examinations and meet other tests of fitness. The subjects cover include security analysis and portfolio management. The analogy with the long-established professional title certified public accountant is evident and essential. This relatively new apparatus of recognition and control should serve to elevate the standards of financial analysts and eventually to place their work on a truly professional basis. Okay, dealings with brokerage houses. One of the most disquieting developments of the period in which we write this revision has been the financial embarrassment in plain words, bankruptcy or near bankruptcy, of quite a few New York Star stock exchange firms, including at least two of considerable size. This is the first time in half a century or more that such a thing has happened, and it is startling for more than one reason. For many decades, the New York Stock Exchange has been moving in the direction of closer and stricter controls over the operations and financial condition of its members, including minimal capital, minimum capital requirements, surprise audits, and the like. Besides this, we have had 37 years of control over the exchange, exchanges and their members by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Finally, the stock broker, the stock brokerage industry itself is operating under favorable conditions, namely a huge increase in volume, fixed minimum, Commission rates, largely eliminating competitive fees, and a limited number of member firms. The first financial troubles of the brokerage houses in 1969 were attributed to the increase in volume of stock. This, it, it was claimed, overtaxed their faculty facilities, increasing increased their overhead, and produced many troubles in making financial settlements. It should be pointed out this was probably the first time in history that important enterprises have gone broke because they had more business than they could handle. 1970s brokerage failures increased. They were blamed chiefly on the falling off of the volume. A strange complaint when one reflects that the turnover of the New York Stock Exchange in 1970 totaled 2,937 million shares, the largest volume in history, and well over twice as large as in any year before 1965. During the 15 years of the bull market ending in 1964, the annual volume has averaged only 712 million shares one quarter of the 1970 figure, but the brokerage business has enjoyed the greatest prosperity in its history. If it, as it appears, member firms as a whole had allowed their overhead and other expenses to increase at a rate that could not sustain even a mild reduction in volume during part of the year, this does not speak well for either their business acumen or their financial conservatism. The third explanation of the financial trouble finally emerged out of the mist of concealment and we suspect that it is the most plausible and significant of the three. It seems that a good part of the capital of certain brokerage houses was held in the form of common stock owned by the individual partners. And some of these seem to have been highly speculative and carried at inflated value. When the market declined in 1969, the quotations on the securities fell drastically, and a substantial part of the capital of the firms vanished with them. In effect, Partners were speculating with the capital that was supposed to protect the customers against the ordinary financial hazards of the brokerage business in order to make a double profit thereon. This was inexcusable. We were afraid to say more. <laughs> Number two footnote. The New York Stock Exchange has imposed some drastic rules of valuation known as haircuts, designed to minimize the danger, but apparently they did not help sufficiently. Bad, bad. The investor should use his intelligence not only in formulating his financial policy, but also in the associated details. These include the choice of a reputable broker to execute his orders. Up to now, it was sufficient to counsel our readers to deal only with a member of the New York Stock Exchange, unless he had compelling reasons to use a non-member firm. Reluctantly, we must add some further advice in this area. We think that people who do not carry margin accounts and in our vocabulary, that means all non-professional investors, should have the delivery and receipt of their securities handled by their bank. When giving a buying order to your broker, you can instruct them to deliver the securities bought, bought to your bank against payment thereof by the bank. Conversely, when selling, you can instruct your bank to deliver securities to the broker against payment of the proceeds. 
paid services will cost a little extra, but they should be well worth the expense in terms of safety and peace of mind. This advice may, re- may be disregarded as no longer called for after the investor is sure that the problem with stock exchanges has been disposed of, but not before. <laughs> um, investment thinkers. The term investment banker is applied to a firm that engages to an important extent in originating, underwriting, and selling new issues of stocks and bonds. To underwrite means to guarantee to the issuing corporation or other issuer that the security will be fully sold. A number of um, brokerage houses carry on a certain amount of underwriting activity. Generally, this is confined to participating in underwriting groups formed by leading investment bankers. There is an additional tendency for brokerage firms to originate and sponsor minor moderately issue financing, particularly in the form of smaller issues of common stock when a bull market is in full swing. Investment banking is perhaps the most respectable department of the Wall Street community because it is here that finance plays its constructive role of supplying new capital for the expansion of industry. In fact, much of the theoretical justification for maintaining active stock markets, notwithstanding the frequent speculative excesses lies in the fact that organized security exchanges facilitate the sale of new issues of bonds and stocks. The investors or speculators could not expect to see the ready market for a new security offer they might well refuse to buy it. The relationship between the investment banker and the investor is basically that of the salesman to the prospective buyer. For many years past, the great bulk of the new offerings in dollar value has consisted of bond issues were purchased in the main by financial institutions such as banks and insurance companies. In this business, security salesmen have been dealing with shrewd and experienced buyers. Hence, any recommendations made by the investment bankers to these customers have had to pass careful and skeptical scrutiny. Thus, these transactions are almost always affected on a business-like footing. But a different situation obtains in the relationship between the individual security buyer and the investment banking firms, including the stockbrokers acting as underwriters. Here, the purchaser is frequently inexperienced and seldom shrewd. He is easily influenced by what the salesman tells him, especially in the case of common stock issues. Since often his unconfessed desire in buying is cheaper to make a quick profit, the effect of all this is that the public investor's protection lies less in his own critical faculty than in the scruples and ethics of the offer. Footnote 3. New offerings may now be sold only by means of a prospectus prepared under the rules of the Securities and Exchange Commission. This document must disclose all the pertinent facts about the issue and the issuer, and it is fully, adi- and it is fully adequate to inform the prudent investor as to the exact nature of the security offer. But the very copiousness of the data required usually makes the prospectus of prohibitive length, it's generally agreed that only a small percentage of individuals buying new securities read the perspective with the thoroughness. Thus, they are still acting mainly not on their own judgment, but on the of in-house selling, then the security, or the recommendation of the individual salesman or accountant. Okay. <sighs> in 1969, we stated at that point, the bad results of this unsound attitude toward show themselves currently in the underwriting field and with notable effects in the sale of new common stock issues during periods of active speculation. Shortly thereafter, this warning proved urgent. We needed. I'm oh, sorry, I broke into it. It is a tribute to the honesty and confidence of the underwriting firms that they are able to combine fairly well the discordant roles of advisor and but it's imperative for the buyer to trust himself to the judgment of the seller. Then you can now see at this point the bad results of this unsighted attitude show what themselves are currently in the underwriting field and with notable effects in the sale of new common stock issues during periods of active speculation. Shortly thereafter, this warning proved urgently needed, as already pointed out, the years 1960, 1961, and again in 1968 to 1969, were marked by an unprecedented outpouring of issues of lowest quality, sold to the public at absurdly high offering prices and in many cases pushed much higher by heedless speculation and some semi-manipulation. A number of the more important Wall Street houses have participated to some degree in these less than creditable activities, 
which demonstrates that the familiar combination of greed and folly and irresponsibility have not been exorcised from the financial system. The intelligent investor will pay attention to the advice and recommendations received from investment banking houses, especially those known by him to have an excellent reputation, and he will be sure to bring sound and independent judgment to bear upon these suggestions, either his own, he is confident, or that of some other type of advisor. Good morning, Charlie. <laughs> other advisors, it is a good old custom, especially in the smaller towns, to consult one's local banker about investment. A commercial banker may not be a thoroughgoing expert on security values, but he is experienced and conservative. He's especially useful to the unskilled investor who is often tempted to stray from the straight and unexciting path of a defensive policy and needs the steadying influence of a prudent mind. The more alert and aggressive investor seeking counsel in the selection of security bargains will not ordinarily find the commercial banker's viewpoint to be especially suited to his own objectives. To take a more critical attitude toward the widespread custom of asking investment advice from relatives and friends, the inquirer always thinks he has a good reason for assuming that the person consulted has superior knowledge or experience. Our own observation indicates that it is almost as difficult to select satisfactory lay advisors than it is to select the proper securities are needed. Much bad advice is given free. Summary. Investors who are prepared to pay a fee for the management of their funds may wisely select some well-established and well-recommended investment counsel. Alternatively, they may use the investment department of a large trust company or the supervisory service applied on a fee basis by a few of the leading New York stock exchange houses. The results to be expected are in no wise exceptional, are in no wise exceptional, but they are commensurate with those of the average long-form and cautious investor. Most security buyers obtain advice without paying for it specifically. It stands to reason, therefore, that in the majority of cases they are not entitled to and should not expect better than average results. They should be wary of all persons, whether customers, brokers, or security salesmen, who promise spectacular income or profits. This applies both to selection of securities and to guidance in the elusive and perhaps elusive art of trading in the market. Passive investors, as we have defined them, will not ordinarily be equipped to pass independent judgment on security recommendations made by their advisors. But they can be explicit and even repetitiously so in stating the kind of securities they want to buy. If they follow their own prescription, they will confine themselves to high grade bonds and the common stock of leading corporations, preferably those that can be purchased at individual price levels that are not high in the light of experience and analysis. The security analysts of any reputable stock exchange costs can make up a suitable list of such common stocks and can certify to the investor. Whether or not the existing price level, therefore, is a reasonably conservative one as judged by past experience. The aggressive investor will ordinarily work in active cooperation with his advisors. He will want the recommendations explained in detail. He will insist on passing his own judgment upon them. This means that the investor will gear his expectations and the character of his security operations to the development of his own knowledge and experience in the field. Only in the exceptional case where the integrity and confidence of the advisors have been thoroughly demonstrated should the investor decline the advice of others without understanding the decision the decision made. There have always been unprincipled stock salesmen and fly by the night stock brokers. And as a matter of course, we have advised our readers to confine their dealings, if possible, to members of the New York Stock Exchange. But we are reluctantly compelled to add the extra cautious counsel that security deliveries and payments be made through the intermediary of the investor's bank. Distressing Wall Street brokerage house picture may have cleared up completely in a few years, but in late 1971, we still suggest better safety signs. There you have it. And then it just repeats itself, yeah? In the housing, the housing crisis where all those banks and failed. Oh. 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 So it must be because young people are running the show, no experience, they become over leveraged and they destroy businesses. That is just human nature. It's right down. Okay, thanks for being on. I will do another chapter probably tomorrow because I missed the days. It's two days this week. Yeah, so I'll probably do at least one more chapter tomorrow. We'll see. I'll send out an email. So get on the email list, guys. If you're not on it already, yes, financiallyfree.com. Go there. Put your name, email in there if you haven't, because then I'll update you and tell you if I'm going to do one. Okay? 
Love you guys. Have a great day. Good luck with investing. Aloha.